Gaha! I know I made you wait, but finally, we are back with more rants. This time we're looking at the highly requested Kichikuo Rants, which serves as the finale to the retro timeline of the Rants series. To explain what that's all about, I gotta give you a bit of a history lesson. Rants is developer Alisoft's flagship series and it's all about our favorite narcissistic psychopath of a fantasy hero getting into all manner of wild and sexy adventures with varying levels of consent. It's been loved by the creators and the players alike. Rants 1, 2, 3, 4, 4.1, and 4.2 all did pretty well and the characters and lore expanded with each new entry into the series. However, in the mid-90s, Alisoft were having some financial trouble, serious enough that the future of the company was uncertain. They knew their time might be up and they wanted to give Rance a proper send-off. So they poured everything they had into a game that would release in 1996 as Kichikuo Rance. And it sold incredibly well. Like, it arguably straight up saved the company. This game went from being Alisoft's swan song to their savior. Eventually, they decided they weren't done with Rance, so they ended up retconning Kichikuo Rance so they could continue the story from where 4.2 left off. And after some time, they went and released Rance 01, which is a remake of Rance 1 bringing the game up to a modern standard, adding a ton of new story content, and tweaking Rance himself to be a bit more in line with his modern day character who's a bit nicer than his original version. Eventually, it was decided to officially split the series into two separate canons. There's the retro timeline, which is simply all the PC-98 titles capping off with Kichikuo Rance, which by the way are all officially freeware now. You can just download and play them legally for free. Alisoft are incredibly based. And there's the modern timeline of the remakes of the first three games and then Rance 5D through 10. Rance 4 is in kind of a weird spot since it never got a remake and it doesn't look like that's ever going to change. So Kichikuo Rance is the end point of the retro timeline. And this game is fucking good. Like, not just good for a Rance game, and let's be honest, the gameplay of the other PC-98 titles is mid at best, but genuinely a great game to play. So what kind of game is it? Rance as a series is partially defined by the fact that each game in the series has a different core gameplay system. Rance 1 was an old school adventure game. Rance 2 was a basic dungeon crawler. Rance 3 was a semi-random turn-based strategy RPG. Rance 4 was a more player-controlled version of that with an almost Metroidvania-style level design. Kichikuo Rance makes the jump to grand strategy of all things. The premise of the game is that Rance had become the leader of a bandit group because he found it fun to raid and pillage in Hellman. However, he soon bit off more than he could chew and got thoroughly thrashed by the army. He barely escaped, but his slave and companion Syl was captured alongside one of his subordinates, Sol. So he ends up marrying Queen Leah of Lazis, who had been pining after him ever since he... struggle-snuggled her back in the first game. This made him king, with an army he could use to invade Hellman and rescue Syl, and maybe take over the world while he's at it. And that's what this game is, conquering territories and managing your troops and economy. But before we dive into gameplay, let's quickly go over aesthetics. To put it simply, I believe Kichikuo Rance is the best looking and best sounding game in the series up to this point. The art is fantastic, the soundtrack, which has always been good regardless, absolutely slaps, the sound effects are punchy and effective, and the character designs themselves are better than they've ever been. I mean, just look at Rance himself. If that shit-eating grin doesn't encapsulate everything he's about, I don't know what does. But as always, feel free to look at the video footage, of which I'm only going to show the first few hours of gameplay to avoid accidentally spoiling people, and listen to the music in the background to make your own decisions. Oh, and just for future reference, I know that due to different translators working on different games, there are some inconsistencies with certain names and spellings. For the sake of ease, I'm just going to refer to everything as it is in Kichikuo Rants, even if it gets changed in later titles. The gameplay itself is turn-based, with you doing whatever actions you can get done and then ending the turn, advancing time by one week and allowing for the other political entities to do their thing. At the start of each turn, you may encounter an event which can be anything from fluff to advancing quests or giving you hints on how to do certain things. You'll also gain tax revenue from all your cities, and your units will partially recover their troops, which are effectively a secondary health bar. During each turn, you can do several things. You can attack any city that's connected to your territory, sending up to four units to engage in combat with the defenders. More on that later. You can attack as many times as you want, but each unit costs money to deploy and they can only be used in one combat per turn, meaning they will be unable to defend your territory on any turn they attack. Additionally, once you successfully capture a city, you can no longer attack anything else that turn. You can do one city action per turn. The two standard actions are a temporary levy and bolstering defense. The levy gives you some money, potentially an item, and if there's an event in that city, levying is typically how to access it. Bolstering defense costs money but makes that city easier to defend. Excellent if you're trying to whittle down a tough opponent or are fighting a war on multiple fronts. 
There are also a variety of other things you can do in specific cities such as visit a notable location, see certain characters, or advance individual side quests. Generally speaking, if it's an option in a city menu, it probably costs a city action to do. You can also visit one distant location per turn. Most of these are dungeons which you can select a single unit to traverse a dungeon in search of rewards. I'll go in more depth on this later. And on top of that, you can talk to one of your generals per week, usually just giving fluff text but sometimes advancing side quests. You can fully replenish one unit's troops or increase their max troops for a cost that increases exponentially the more you try to add in a single turn. And last but not least, you can call a member of Rance's harem. If he successfully boinks the lady in question, he'll gain some experience. Sometimes he won't be able to for story reasons, in which case he'll gain nothing. You'll also have access to ninjas. One at the start, but you can get more later on. Each of them can be used once per turn to scout an attacking force, telling you exactly what you're up against. To scout a foreign city, which will give you useful information, though there is a chance of failure, either wasting the action or killing that ninja permanently. And you can sabotage a city, reducing its defense, though it comes with a fairly high failure chance. Combat is a pretty simple affair. All your units have health and troops. Health is self-explanatory. If it drops to zero, that unit dies, and in the vast majority of cases, this is a permadeath. Troops act as a secondary health bar and as an attacking force. They deal damage and soak up most of the incoming damage. If they are wiped out, the unit isn't dead, but they'll be in a very vulnerable position and won't be dealing very much damage. When attacking or defending, you can deploy up to four units, two in the front line and two in the back line. There are broadly three types of units, melee, archers, and mages. Melee units are the beefiest and often deal the most damage, but they're restricted to the front line and can only attack other front line units. It's worth noting that melee attacks usually result in the target fighting back, dealing damage to both sides. Mages are backline units who typically excel at taking out big chunks of an enemy frontline with no retaliation, though they're usually less effective against enemy backline units. Archers are basically the same, though they aren't quite as effective against tanky melee units and are instead excellent at taking out enemy archers and mages while being fairly resistant to magic attacks. Some of these units can also be strategists. If an allied strategist successfully strategizes at the start of combat, your units will gain a percentage boost. If an enemy strategist does the same, you'll get a percentage debuff. There are also special demon units, which still act as one of the core three classes, but they can only be damaged by other demons or by one of two unique weapons that you'll be able to get pretty early into the game. When a unit on either side is killed, all other units move up one space. This can put backline units into the front line, opening them up to melee attacks. Each battle lasts until one of the following conditions is met. 1. Four entire turns have passed. This forces the attackers out. 2. One side is wiped out. Duh. 3. One side decides to retreat. The player can retreat at the start of any allied unit's action. The AI can do the same, though it typically follows a set pattern for when it retreats. When attacking, the AI will usually retreat upon losing a unit. When defending, it's typically to the death. Certain enemies behave differently, but that's generally how it goes. When defending, you'll have a choice of a plains battle or a city battle. There's some complexity here, but the simple version is that in a plains battle, both sides deal more damage to each other, whereas in a city battle, both sides can only have a limited number of troops attacked per turn, determined by the field size of that city, and the defenders get a bit of a boost on top of that. So a field size of 300 will result in only 300 units on either side attacking per volley. Plains battles are great for when you know you overpower an enemy and want to wipe them out quickly. City battles are good for minimizing your own losses and whittling down enemies over time. Certain units are more effective in certain roles. As an easy example, Rick gains a boost when attacking, and Cordova gains a boost when defending. When attacking an enemy city, the AI will choose between planes and city. On top of this, some units have special attacks. These generally fall into two categories, direct damage and beam. Direct damage attacks, such as Rance's Rance attack or Rick's By the Way, will bypass an enemy's troops to damage the general's health directly. Beam attacks, such as Shizuka's Black Destruction Beam, will do a big chunk of damage to troops, scaling with target troop numbers and ignoring field size. To use a special attack, select the Wait command to have them charge up for a turn, after which the special attack will appear as an option next turn. Not all units have special attacks, and you can see who does in your subordinates menu. Dungeons are very simple affairs, even compared to previous Rance game. Instead of proper levels, each dungeon is simply a series of floors and you can choose to advance, go back, or leave. Occasionally, the unit you send in will be thrown into a one-on-one -on -one with a monster unit that cannot be retreated from, meaning you need to kill, die, or run out the move limit. The reward for these dungeons is usually some kind of treasure, but you can also obtain dirty CGs, meet NPCs, and advance certain side quests. You can only do one dungeon attempt per turn, but you can always enter a dungeon starting from wherever the previous attempt ended. Some units are much better in dungeons than others. 
For example, Bars is an excellent battlefield unit, but he actually gets a significant penalty in dungeons. You'll encounter several good Dungeoneers in your playthrough, but Layla is probably the best at the start of the game. The object of the game is pretty simple. Unite humanity by conquering the human nations and then win the inevitable war with the demons and monsters. Unlike previous Rants games, which have generally been fairly linear, Kijupo Rants gives you a lot of freedom as far as how to go about it, with pretty much the only restriction being that the demons are locked off until later on, since you have to make your way through Zeth or Hellman to even get to them. The default lose conditions are Rance dying in combat or Liz's castle falling to any enemy. But just because you can do things in any order you like doesn't mean you necessarily should. See, Kichuko Rance is a game that leans very heavily into time limits and event triggers. From the very start of when you gain control of Lazus, you'll be working against the clock. The first time limit is a two-tiered deadline to conquer the city where Sil and Sol are being imprisoned. Take too long and you'll lose Sol. Take longer still and you lose Sil. You'll also be periodically seeing story stuff happening in the demon realm, and if you leave them be, they eventually start attacking, and trust me, you want to be able to focus all your attention on them. There are also a large number of instances where doing a specific thing will add in an additional challenge or element of danger. With Helmand specifically, taking certain sections of the country will cause different enemy generals to mobilize their units against you. Take too long to deal with Helmand, and a powerful respawning enemy will appear until you deal with them at their source. Attack a specific city elsewhere, and assassins will be sent against Rance and his generals until that country is subjugated. Taking one particular city will result in either losing a general or immediately going to war with the neighboring country. One character will get sick at some point after recruiting her, requiring a lengthy side quest and partial conquest of a specific enemy territory to prevent her from dying outright. Recruiting one unit will eventually result in other units getting killed if you don't get him killed quickly. Kichigo Rants gives you a lot of freedom, but there's almost always something putting pressure on you, and there are numerous ways you can unintentionally make your life much more difficult. So while you're not forced into any particular direction, you do have a sense of purpose for the entire game. And this leads me to what is simultaneously the best and worst thing about this game. There is a ridiculous amount of things interacting with each other, and the actions you take can mess with a bunch of stuff all at once. On the one hand, this is really cool. It rewards game knowledge and encourages replay so you can more effectively utilize the secrets you uncover. In one case, you can even use your knowledge of multiple independent bad events and actually play things so that you effectively cancel them both out. Or once you know about the specific triggers for difficult things, you can more effectively plan a course of action. Or hell, the borders with both Hellman and Zeth are designed to be difficult for either side to pierce, but with some experimentation, you can find a workaround that can massively expedite future playthroughs. The game is chock full of this kind of thing. On the other hand, there's so much hidden stuff, and a lot of said stuff can be very easily mishandled. It's exceptionally easy to end up locking off certain enemy units that you could have otherwise recruited without even realizing they're recruitable in the first place. As I mentioned earlier, attacking certain cities will ramp up the difficulty, and in some instances, you can set off timers that will make your life awful with no way of knowing about it beforehand. For example, if you attack and fail to conquer one specific city, which is extremely hard to take over in a single turn, the nation's leader will send assassins after you. One of them will periodically steal quite a bit of money from you and can assassinate your units randomly. The other one will kill Rance and cause a game over if you don't take out that city quickly enough. If you take over certain parts of Hellman at the wrong time, you'll suddenly be needing to take on extra attackers each turn that you may not be prepared for. If you recruit that character who gets sick, you may well be in the middle of a war and can't afford to start a new one in order to get the cure, meaning you lose a pretty decent unit without really knowing how to prevent it. Chances are, your first playthrough of Kijiko Rance will end up being severely hindered if not outright fucked by some bullshit that you couldn't have reasonably foreseen. And this is especially true when you consider some of the retro jank that unfortunately does make its way into this game. Let me tell you how my first playthrough went. I was at war with Hellman and making decent progress. Starting the war kicked off a timed event that I had to deal with. Essentially, the idea was that Morris will give you warnings about suspicious activity in one of your randomly selected cities as a start of turn event. Levy there to find the suspicious person. You need to do this a total of four times to prevent a very bad thing and recruit a new unit. Just one problem. You can only get one start of turn event each turn. This warning does not take priority over other events, meaning you can fail to get this event so much as a single time before you lose nearly all your money. I got that warning twice. This basically spelled the beginning of the end of that playthrough. Upon further research, I learned that it's common practice to save scum for four turns, since if you happen to levy the correct city even without the warning, that counts. I may have also in that playthrough had a run-in with those assassins I mentioned earlier, who killed one of my best units. And of course, there were multiple instances where I triggered enemy attacks that I just wasn't ready for. It's frustrating to get cock-slapped by something that you had no realistic way of knowing about on a blind playthrough. And honestly, it wouldn't be so bad if Kichigo Rance wasn't a 90s game. 
Modern day games, especially those that have that VN influence that Rance has, come with a level of quality of life that Kichigo Rance just doesn't have but would massively benefit from. For example, later Rance games have New Game Plus mechanics so that your failures don't feel like failures and you get rewarded for aggressive experimentation. Additionally, a way to skip the Bandit phase, which is effectively a tutorial followed by an unskippable OP, would have been nice for repeat playthroughs. A skip red text option that's pretty much industry standard for visual novels and arrow games nowadays would have been great here. But that does lead into something I actually quite like about this game. See, in video games, the player generally needs some kind of incentive to do each bit of content. For example, that's why side quests in most games will come with a reward of money or experience points. There needs to be an actual good pragmatic reason to experience content that's not a part of the critical path or players just won't for the most part. This can be in-game resources, weapons and items, or even something as simple as ticking a box on a checklist or filling a progress bar. But the fact remains that there's almost always some sort of in-game benefit to doing this content. Well, in Kichiko Rants, while there are definitely plenty of gameplay relevant rewards, a lot of times it's an H scene, and even though I was playing this game for the game and not for the H content, I still found myself motivated to try to hunt down these events. I felt a sense of accomplishment when I figured out the trick that allowed me to finally boink a specific lady. It was exciting to come across an H scene that I wasn't expecting after doing something out of the way. It was cool to see things I do have an actual effect, even if that effect was just more sex. And I believe this is in large part due to how complex and interconnected everything is. There are just so many little hidden secrets that I was constantly looking forward to throughout my entire time with the game and I know I haven't even come close to finding them all. Even on repeat playthroughs I found myself doing some of these optional tasks despite not having any practical reason to and despite the fact that I had already experienced the scenes you get as a reward. And even though I just generally like the sex as a reward thing that Eroge tends to do, it's rare that a game makes me feel as engaged by it as Kichuko Rants. Even the previous Rants games didn't do that. There were times in those games where I would know exactly how to get a specific scene but say to myself, nah, not worth the effort. But with Kichuko Rants, there was shit hidden around every corner and it was always exciting to explore this game. Now, I did kind of shit on Kichuko Rants a bit earlier for some of the bullshit it gets up to and it definitely gets up to some bullshit. But ultimately, I found this game to be immensely satisfying once you get what's going on. And admittedly, some of that game knowledge comes about in spite of the game. A lot of the in-game mechanics are poorly explained or just straight up not explained at all. Even the little tips you can get from the main menu only go so far. When I first announced that I was playing Kichigo Rants, I no lie had five separate people independently and unprompted tell me to go in blind for my first playthrough but to make sure to order the construction of a hospital as soon as the option became available. The game doesn't emphasize the importance of that and the hospital option is like in the middle of all the other possible construction projects. But if you don't have it soon enough, you will lose people. So the game has some information issues, but it very much rewards you for learning about it. My first playthrough ended pretty horribly. I got that bad event I mentioned earlier and my wild flailing resulted in a lot of wasted money, some dead units, and a slow strangulation without having even conquered a single enemy nation. Second playthrough, I cleaned up my act a bit and proactively acted to prevent that bad event and avoid certain fuck you triggers until I was good and ready for them. That time, I swept through all the human territories and got ready to go up against the demons. Unfortunately, I had poorly managed my resources earlier, resulting in too much money and not enough troops, and I missed a chance at recruiting a bunch of units that would have been very handy at that point. And then I overextended a bit fighting the demons, and it was just a bit too much to deal with all at once. So I quit instead of spending hours trying to get out of the hole I dug myself into. Disappointing, but a massive improvement. Third playthrough, I fixed most of my earlier mistakes and had a solid plan of action. This time, I also made sure to beef up certain key units that I knew I was going to need in the late game. I also had much more of a laser focus in the demon phase, carving a path to priority targets and avoiding certain areas that had more fuck you triggers. I had also by that point figured out how to do the various side quests that became available at this stage, which weaken or outright get rid of some of the attacking demons. Oh, and I learned how to use special attacks. Remember how I said you needed to use the wait command to use specials? Yeah, I didn't realize that and that made things a whole lot more difficult. And I also learned a plethora of little pieces of info that helped me along the way. And I beat the game without losing a single unit. Every new playthrough was like a completely different experience because I was able to build on everything I had learned in my last playthrough and I have absolutely no doubt that if I were to start a new playthrough right now, I would kick even more ass than before. Kichiko Rants does have a bit of a learning curve before you hit the skill floor, but there is a ton of room to grow and even once you're at the point where you can comfortably navigate the game, there are still tons of optimizations you can make and optional goals to shoot for. For example, at the end of a playthrough you'll be graded on things that happen to individual characters. Many of the characters you encounter can have a fortune ending and a misfortune ending. These don't really matter much except for the sound effect for a fortune is much more pleasant. 
but that gives you some incentive to actively shoot for as many fortunes as possible. Keep in mind that it's completely impossible to obtain every fortune in a single playthrough, as some are mutually exclusive by their nature, and some outright require the deaths or misfortunes of other characters. But on top of that, a lot of the fortunes require some form of sacrifice or extra effort from the player. Several fortunes require you to pass up age scenes or remove certain characters from your harem. Hell, one fortune is literally, didn't have sex with Rance. One fortune requires you to not recruit one of the best units in the game. If you want to recruit the best strategist in the game, you have to lock a different character into their misfortune. A few fortunes require lengthy and obscure side quests without much gameplay benefit, if any. But I really like that about this game. There's always a stretch goal, and if you want to push yourself to do more, get better results by imposing limitations on yourself, you can do that kind of thing. I always appreciate a game that gives you room to grow and any reason at all to want to try. Even a superficial one like getting dings instead of buzzes at the end of the game. Things like this are the reason that even though I've had my fill of Kichupo rants for the time being, I'm going to keep it installed and I'm sure I'll be booting it up again in the future. I really had a great time with it. I should also mention that there is a true ending to this game, and to get it you need to meet a bunch of criteria that I won't spoil here, and then the game kicks off a secret final act which is much harder and you'll have to complete another series of difficult tasks while also trying not to get overwhelmed by the many, many powerful attacks coming your way. I gotta say, I really like it conceptually. I think secret endings with bonus gameplay are swell, and the lore implications are interesting to say the least. But I'm not too thrilled by the execution for two main reasons. Firstly, I think the things you need to do to unlock the ending can be a bit too cryptic, as are the tasks you need to do to beat the game in that state. Secondly, the final act's programming is a bit fucky, and if RNG does not favor you, it's pretty easy for things to get more difficult than Alisoft intended them to be, and you can actually get softlocked, which is not fun. So I was left a little disappointed, but it's a neat idea, and one that I'll be looking out for when I eventually get to play Rants 10. I genuinely don't know if they'll rehash this particular story, and I could see it going either way. But don't spoil me in the comments, please. I'd like to experience it for myself when the time comes. Overall, the gameplay of Kichikuo Rants is a bit obtuse, but once you get it down, it's some of the most fun you can have in the retro grand strategy genre, even though I'd argue that once you understand it, it might even be a bit too easy. I am genuinely shocked at how good this game is. While Rants would eventually push out some games with excellent gameplay, including Sengoku Rants, which inspired a fucking subgenre of strategy games, one thing that tends to bind the retro games together is that the gameplay isn't usually very good. Up to this point, the best game in the series from strictly a gameplay perspective was probably Rants 3, though you could make the case for Rants 4, and neither of those was any better than mediocre. 1, 2, and 4.x were downright bad for the most part. The series as a whole had been hard carried by the writing, which started out as a ton of fun before morphing into actual excellence. So the fact that they went from that to a retro gem of a game is mind-blowing. If you take nothing else from this video, play this game. It may take you a bit to get it, but it's very worth it. But you know I can't just leave it there. This is an ads video, so I have to talk about writing. Spoiler warning from here on out, by the way. Now let me tell you something. When I started playing this game, I did not expect to have this take, and I feel almost dirty for having written this next sentence in my script. But I feel like the writing of Kichupo Rants is a significant step down from 3 and 4, and the more I step back and think about it, the more convinced I am. And the thing is, I know exactly why it is the way it is. If you remember from earlier, Kichikuo Rants was the result of Alisoft being backed into a corner and tasked with closing off a series that had really only just begun to ramp up story-wise. Rants 3 introduced the Lazus Hellman War, and Rants 4 introduced the extended lore of the universe. And throughout all this, the demons were slowly being introduced and examined. But this was all still early stuff that hadn't been seriously developed yet. Now, all of a sudden, they have to tie it all together and conclude it. And that's not to mention that they also had to cram in stuff about the nations of Zeth and Japan, which had only been referenced in passing up to this point. Kichiko Rants suffers from too much story and not enough game. Individual sections of story in Kichiko Rants get entire games worth of stories once the series picks back up. From what I can tell based on the titles, Rants 6 is the Zeth arc of Kichiko Rants, Sengoku Rants is the Japan arc, and Rants 9 is the Hellman arc. Of course, things aren't one to one since Rants isn't King of Lazus there, but you get the point. Because of how much Alisoft were forced to cram into a single game, all of it ends up very underbaked. The plot doesn't do much, and the majority of the characters don't feel like they actually meaningfully impact on the story. So let me expand on that. Due to the nature of this game being such that permadeath is a thing, every major story beat needs to be able to happen independent of the existence of most of the cast. Even Syl, Rance's partner in crime, can die and the game still needs to be beatable. Hellman, Japan, and Zeth still need to fall in the same manner as before. So despite being a huge deal in the series as a whole, as well as probably being the only woman Rance actually loves, 
still has very little impact on any of the plot events until pretty late in the game, where her status as alive or dead determines which endings are achievable in that playthrough. And she arguably has the most agency of these characters. Bars, Rick, Konami, Maria, Millie, all characters who have been built up as important figures in this world, all of which who do absolutely fuck all in Kichiko Rance's story. Yeah, there are some side quests and fortunes they can impact, but nothing that actually fucking matters to the plot. They are gameplay elements that add a bit of fluff to the writing. They don't actually have anything resembling agency in this story, and that is a damn shame. With very few exceptions, the individual characters in Kichiko Rance really don't feel like they matter. It's very, very clear to me that while Alisoft poured their heart and soul into this game, they really weren't ready to close off the series. If we take the series narrative as a whole and assume it runs on a standard three-act structure, it feels like Rance 4 marked the end of the first act. The first two games are mostly inconsequential, and I don't think Alisoft were really thinking too far ahead with those ones. Rants 3 and 4 took a lot of time to transition the two dumb little one-off games in Rants 1 and 2 into a big, serious story that sets up an even bigger series of conflicts. They gave this world real stakes and set up a ton of political intrigue that was just barely starting to develop. To go from that to a conclusion makes things kind of complicated. And on top of that, let's not forget that Kichigo Rants features the nations of Japan and Zeth. Zeth has only been mentioned in passing up to this point, and I genuinely don't remember if Japan was talked about at all. They did not even get a proper setup yet. They were introduced and closed off in the same game, and with the amount of time allotted to them, it's just not enough. Each of them got one or two interesting story beats, no real expansion on them, and then we move on to the next territory. The pacing is fucked on both the game level and in terms of the entire series. This holds true with individual character arcs as well. I already talked about how they were kind of fucked over as parts of the story, but their own individual stories also feel kind of stunted. Most of the long-standing characters had some sort of story building up, and it's clear that Alisoft had to close them off before they were ready while also doing full story arcs for characters whose stories had been hinted at but not fully kicked off yet, and new characters who had to do everything from introduction to conclusion in a single game. Much like the plot story arcs, there just wasn't enough time to do it all justice. Shizuka spent the past three games desperately searching for the man who killed her father, only for that confrontation to happen out of the blue and end up a footnote in the Zeth arc. Konami had a swath of conflicting emotions that were tormenting her since the first game. She owed a debt of loyalty to Queen Leah, but also resented her for the lack of freedom that entails as she aches for companionship and longs for a normal life. Her fortune ends with her finding love in Zeth, but it doesn't really feel like it logically follows all the buildup from the series so far. Minova has this really awesome story where she came from nothing, climbing her way through the ranks of the Hellman army, and then reaches the very top and claims the throne right before Rance takes it for himself. She may not have been able to hold on to her power, but she went from nothing to Empress, even if only for a few moments. That's cool as fuck, but there was no real time or care given to it. This trend holds true for the majority of the cast, and while I understand why things are the way they are, I can't help but be a bit disappointed. And to Alisoft's credit, I'm told that many of these ideas introduced in Kichuko Rants are given that proper care in the modern canon, but that doesn't change the fact that this game is just brimming with potential that really fizzled out on a narrative level. And look, I know that by 1996 standards, Kichuko Rants' writing still does go above and beyond. This was long before video game stories were taken seriously on any kind of consistent basis. But by Rant's standards, it's kinda weak, honestly. I had a real hard time caring about anything that was going on because there just wasn't enough attention given to any of it, and very few of the in-game characters had any relevance to the story regardless. The one exception to this would be part of the demon arc. Alisoft handled the demons pretty well in my opinion. Throughout the game, there would be these cutscenes that would showcase some of the characters involved in the demon civil war and how the factions were operating. They showed the main villain Cableus conquering the nation, and you see a slowly developing storyline between the demon sisters Sazel and Hawzil who were separated but can experience the other's sensations. And that story gets pretty fucked up, but I was enthralled by it. Actual care was given to this portion of the story, and as a result, even though Rance doesn't meet the sisters until late into the game, I grew to care about them and their story even more than I ended up caring about the main demon conflict. And side note, Sazel and Hazel are literally the inspiration for Chocola and Vanilla in Nekopata, which is kinda funny. I'd normally go into the plot of the story and dissect it to talk about the good and the bad it does, but I honestly don't think it would be good content because there's just so little of substance here. As an actual story, Kichuo Rance really doesn't hold up. That's not to say that the writing isn't enjoyable. Oh no no, this is a Rance game after all. While the series is a phenomenal piece of storytelling, it's also a wild parody of RPGs featuring this hilarious, narcissistic, psychopath of an anti-hero protagonist. And while I didn't much care for the actual narrative of Kichuko Rance, the minute-to-minute -minute banter and the individual situations Rance finds himself in are consistently funny and entertaining. 
and the characters themselves, while somewhat lacking in the story arc department, are all either extremely likable or utterly despicable depending on what the story calls for. And I just cannot get over some of the goofy bits of dialogue that go on throughout this game. Rance can call in Bar's daughter Harin for a top secret mission. When she leans in to hear the details, he kisses her and dismisses her. Rance at one point cures an epidemic with his dick. That's not even an exaggeration. Rance forges an alliance with the Kalar Nation, who are basically the Rance version of elves, by coercing their queen into sex after breaking out of the semen farm. This makes her realize that sex is pretty legit, and human men would be happy to help the all-female Kalar species thrive. Also, he impregnates her, and that results in motherfucking reset Kalar, who I absolutely love. If Leah gets too jealous, she can curse Syl and turn her into a tiny pink unicorn that the game refers to as a cow for some reason. That one actually has a pretty wholesome ending. It's worth the effort to see that side quest through, in my opinion. Rance can sometimes send Konami on a dangerous trip to an enemy city to get him a burger. One of the units you can recruit is obsessed with football. Like, American football. His house is shaped like a football, and he always wears a football helmet. To the best of my recollection, the existence of football in the Rance universe has not once been acknowledged outside this dumb joke. You can visit the Alisoft headquarters, and Rance will bully the game director Tata. There are multiple instances where Morris will just barely convince Rance to not do something catastrophically stupid. For example, Rance was interested in raping Hanty, and in fairness, she's hot as fuck in this game. Seriously, that's one hell of a glow up. But she could just teleport away and that would break the alliance they have with the rebellious side of the Hellman Civil War. It's just funny to see Rance thinking with his dick while Morris reins him in with facts and logic. Oh yeah, and at one point Rance kills the Pope, who's also French, because why not? So Kichibo Rance roughly translates to Brutal King Rance, and that actually ties into something I've talked about in my Rance videos before. See, the Rance of the 90s and the Rance of the 2010s are practically two different characters. In more modern times, Rance has seen a few tweaks to his character that make him a bit softer than before. One example of this would be how modern Rance has a soft spot for kids and generally treats them quite well. Old Rance has no problem being a dick to kids, though he's not as mean to them as he is to adults. But the main change is that while modern Rance is still very, very cruel, he's nowhere near as sadistic as his old persona. For modern Rance, cruelty is more of a byproduct of him pursuing what he wants, which is usually sexual gratification, rather than the actual goal. But in Kichigo Rance, he does have a tendency to do some pretty fucked up stuff, which is actually much more pronounced if he at any point loses Syl. You could argue that the standard ending is an evil ending, as the world doesn't fundamentally change and Rance rules as a tyrant in a state of perpetual war, but it's really no different to how the world was previously. If Syl dies, you'll unlock endings such as the one where Rance becomes the Demon King and turns his back on humanity entirely, ruling over a monster-filled world. Say what you will about modern Rance, I can't really see him going that far, even without Syl as a stabilizing figure. If you build the SM Tower, you'll unlock a bunch of extra age scenes with the various Harem members, and rather than it just being a kinky kind of thing, Rance will often do things specifically to make the girl unhappy. For example, he edges Leah, which she hates, even though pretty much any other option would have been great for her. With Harin, he ties her up, feeds her a diuretic, and places a picture of her father bars on the ground in front of her, forcing her into either peeing on it or he would release her if she insults him. That kind of thing is just needlessly cruel, and Rance doesn't even get off in that instance. When you, as King, meet the army captain who captured Scylla and Sol at the beginning of the game, you can of course capture her for Rance to do dirty things to her, but you also have the option of gifting her to your men with whom she will meet a very unpleasant end. If Rance was too late to save Syl from prison, he does this automatically. That's way out of line by modern Rance standards, but that's kind of thing old Rance is capable of. But weirdly, at the same time, Rance in this game has some surprisingly wholesome moments. At one point, he discovers that his maid Suzume is having her body sold by her father for political favors. He deals with the issue, and the next time he talks with her, he not only informs her that she's free, but he builds up her confidence by validating her skill as a maid and as a companion, and not just for her body, which he obviously still wants too. When one of his generals, Manad, ends up getting into a relationship with a subordinate who manipulates her into stealing for him, Rance deals with the issue but frames it in such a way that he seems like he genuinely does care for Manad, and he points out that the guy never loved or respected her and he ultimately forgives her and helps mold her into a fine and respected general. At one point, Rance ends up encountering a place with a bunch of dolls who had been magically brought to life as obedient slaves. He takes a liking to the outcast, and after a bunch of other shenanigans, he's given a single wish by a djinn. He wishes to give her life permanently, and she lives out the rest of her life in happiness and luxury in Laza's castle, where Rance actually seems to enjoy indulging her. It's a very weird kind of duality. While I'm used to the idea that modern Rance is an awful person with some occasional flashes of humanity alongside a childlike charisma, it's much stranger to see that in old Rance, and particularly the Kijiguo Rance. Old Rance is much more of a villain than modern Rance, but you do still get those occasional moments where he shows some empathy and acts to help those around him, even if it comes at an immediate cost to himself or even an opportunity cost. 
Just look at that doll, for instance. Rance could have wished for anything, but he gave her a real life. That was really nice of him. While I do love Kichigo Rance as a game, it's moments like this that make me disappointed that Old Rance ended up getting cut short as a series. Yes, the modern games picked things back up, but I'd have been interested to see a complete, fleshed-out story about the original interpretation of this character. And I can't leave the video off without acknowledging one of the best new characters, the King of Zeth, Ragnarok Arc Super Gandhi. He's a charismatic, kind-hearted, lovable dipshit. He sees the good in everyone to the point where he's kind of a dumbass about it. He stops a mugging only to give the thieves a bunch of money because they clearly need it. He stops an attempted gang rape only to then order one of his subordinates to fuck the would-be Rance impersonators because clearly these people are lonely. He sees Rance murdering innocent people and assumes he's sacrificing his own morality for the greater good. This was because Rance got some dust in his eye and Gandhi interpreted that as him crying about his actions. Gandhi also acts as a top-tier wingman for Rance. Of course, since he's a dude, Rance hates him. Not that he really cares. He does share the same unfortunate reality that most everyone in this game is just a background character, but he is highly entertaining, very likable, and if nothing else, may be very eager to get started on Rance 6, because I know he'll definitely be a big part of that game. I know I didn't go too heavy to characters in this video, but I feel like he deserved special mention. Overall, I'd say the writing and story of Kichuo Rance is good for its time, but doesn't meet the high bar that the previous entries had set for it. But despite lacking somewhat in the quality department, it has undeniable entertainment value, and when you consider the game's secret heavy style, you'll be spending dozens of hours uncovering new pieces of story content that will fuel your fun for multiple playthroughs. Don't let the fact that I was pretty harsh in this video discourage you from enjoying it for what it is. Kichigo Rance is an interesting game. In many ways, it was before its time and represents the hard work of a passionate team who did the absolute best they could with what they had to work with. And in the end, they made a game that might lack a bit in terms of writing and certainly isn't perfect, but is arguably one of the best grand strategy games of its era and one that no Rance fan should pass up. I know that its status as technically a spin-off leads many to skip it entirely, but I would strongly advise playing it, both for the chaotic fun that is Rance and for the genuinely top-tier gameplay that will blow your mind when you consider what came before. Kichigo Rance has its issues, but it's a damn good game and it gets my full recommendation. Thanks for watching. Big thank you to my patrons, especially my god-tier supporters Bulk Squat Thrust and Michael Rotolo. Don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed and subscribe for more. You can expect the Rance content to come a bit more frequently from now on. Since I no longer have school hanging over my shoulders, I can actually justify taking the time, and besides, Kichigo Rance made me very hyped to play the rest of the series. Also, be on the lookout for more visual novel content. I've got some plans to cover big titles that people have been asking about, and I'm excited to get into that. Well, with all that being said, thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you next time. I hate ads!